Welcome to uh, session number two in our EE practicum. We're going to be talking uh, today about building a strong prayer partner ministry. So uh, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each of the students who are studying in this uh, practicum, that you would encourage them today. Uh, many of them have family that need encouragement. Many of them are uh, involved in ministry and uh, ministry is always taxing. Pray that you would keep them strong in you and help them as they add this uh, additional time piece of uh, the practicum and the study of the reading and preparation for each lesson. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would hover over us today, especially me as I try to communicate the importance of building a strong prayer partner ministry in a local EE ministry. And so we ask for your guidance today and we ask for your power in Jesus' name, amen. Often in ministry, we're guilty of running ahead of God. Uh, we just haven't begun with prayer. <laughs> Uh, the longer I live, the more I realize that prayer must be our primary concern. E.M. Bounds wrote The Necessity of Prayer in 1929. This little book was uh, one of Dr. Kennedy's favorite, our founder. He loved this little book and uh, states in that uh, letter that he writes about the book, what an inestimable, inestimable uh privilege, I can't even say it, uh, to, it is to be able to talk to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords at a moment's notice and never worry about getting a busy signal. He hoped this little book would cause all of us in evangelism explosion to take prayer more seriously in our ministries. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 9, 38 says, pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth labors into his harvest field. And the actual Greek word, uh, deomai, is meaning beg the Lord of the harvest. Uh, it's, a, it's a very strong, beseeching kind of term that he would send forth laborers into his harvest field. The Lord's focus right before he sends the 12 out in Matthew 10 is for us to beg God for more workers. In the Old Testament, David was a mighty warrior who repeatedly, before he rallied the troops together, would call the people together and ask for direction from God. In the times that he did that, it was very exciting to see how God kind of helped them in their battles. This must be our first call as well, to wait upon the Lord for his guidance on each of our ministries. Waiting on the Lord is a crucial part of serving him. In Acts 1-4, we read that Jesus commanded his disciples, wait for what the Lord has promised. Isaiah 40-31 states, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. How easy it is for us not to make the important time to wait upon the Lord. So as we begin the teaching of this EE practicum, I want us to highlight the necessity and the importance of prayer and the imperative to put this first in our training. So first of all, in the building of a strong prayer ministry, I wanna focus on the priority of prayer. The examples of Christ, of John the Baptist, of Paul and James, and I'm gonna ask you to do an assignment, kind of looking at those men and what their lives said about prayer. Jesus used parables in Luke 18.1 to emphasize the fact that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Jesus didn't just talk about the priority of prayer, he actually models it for us. None of us are busier than Jesus was, and in his time-pressured life, he made the time to pray. We can always make time for what we deem important. In Luke 11.1, 1, the disciples observed Jesus. They came up on him in a prayer time of his own. He was communing with his heavenly Father, and these men were so impressed with the intimacy and the fervency of his prayer that they basically said, Lord, would you teach us to pray like that? Just like John taught his disciples. So the example of John the Baptist and Jesus indicate 
how important prayer is in the mentoring of disciples and to help them to experience the very presence of God. I don't think there's a greater example of prayer at its finest than the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 17. If we really want to know how to pray, this passage of Scripture is a place for us to basically, basically start mining for the gold nuggets of, of, of prayer. Here Christ prays for his disciples and goes on record in praying for believers today. Let me read just a, passion, a part of the passage here where in John 17 and verse 13, he says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, he was speaking of his disciples, and the world has hated them as, uh, because they are not of the world. And even as I am not of the world, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. I set myself apart, that they themselves also may be set apart in the truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, for those who also believe in me through their word. So he's actually preaching for or praying for us. You are you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus really basically said that uh, our lives give lost people a reason to somehow discount Jesus. So if our life isn't uh, prioritized on prayer, uh, we're giving Satan an, an inroad into our life. So Christ prays for his disciples here. He goes on record in praying for the believers today. And I'm going to ask you to do some work uh, in this uh, chapter of John 17. You see, the ministry of intercessory prayer is vital for accomplishing God's work in this world. Andrew Murray, uh, a well-known authority on prayer, made the statement that man, that the man who mobilizes the Christian church to pray will make the greatest contribution to world evangelization in history. Wow, that's, that's quite a powerful statement. All the more reason to make intercessory prayer the foundation on which to build an EE ministry. I truly believe the most sacred duty to which you and I are called is prayer. It's the one spiritual activity that every single one of us can participate in. The Apostle Paul was an incredible prayer warrior and let those he had led to Christ and Christ followers in each of the churches he planted know that he was always lifting their names to the Lord. I try to lift people's names to the Lord. So I try to get the names of their spouses and their children and lift those names to the Lord. In Philippians 1.3, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for all of you. Isn't that interesting that he intertwines joy with the, the matter of prayer? I don't think we do that. It was Paul who admonished the Ephesian believers to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He went on to remind them that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not down here in the horizontal dimensions of our life. Rather, it's in the vertical dimensions against the spiritual forces of wickedness. Where? In the heavenly realms. Satan hates Christ followers to share the good news of the gospel. And if you've been in EE very long, you know that you're fighting the evil one constantly because he knows that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, starting with the Jew and also to the Greek. We know certainly that Satan is upset with anyone who is training people to share the gospel, but he shudders when he sees believers on their knees. Obviously, I've, uh, in building the prayer network for uh, the United States, have really done uh, hand-to-hand combat with the evil one 
during this past year. You see, it was the half-brother of Christ, James, who said the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Then he refers to Elijah as a prime example of what God could do through one man who was totally given to prayer. Now I want us to talk about the pattern of prayer. And we have a little Partners in Praying booklet. A prayer partner is a person who shares in your evangelistic activity by praying for you as an EE trainee or as a trainer, as well as for the people with whom you'll share the gospel. Dr. Kennedy wrote in his book, in the first training semester that prayer partners were required for all EE participants at our church, the number of professions of faith increased more than 100% over the previous training semester. So from there on out, we've had prayer partners, which has been great, but now we're trying to build this network to cover the ministries. A prayer partner must be seeking to walk with Christ and must believe that God answers prayer. You can't really use prayer if you don't believe in it. Potential prayer partners should uh, be led through the little booklet called Partners in Praying, and all of you have that. It's the little blue booklet that we all have. At the beginning of each new semester, I uh, have all of our prayer partners join me in the opening night of our EE training. I want our prayer partners to understand how important their role is in the battle for the souls of men and women. I wanted them to know that we were counting on them to intercede on our behalf. The first night of every semester, we uh, close out the evening with the six prayer partners and the EE team. So all nine members pray together and ask the Lord for his blessing in their efforts to share the gospel, as well as model for the two trainees how to share it as well. I've found in leading EE ministries for over 40 years that trainees and trainers that have faithful prayer partners, they're much more fruitful and less likely to be discouraged and drop out of the training process. Prayer coverage for teams really does work. In the little Partners in Praying booklet, we are given a simple pattern for our prayer partners to use in their prayers. The ACTS, A-C-T-S, acrostic, provides a simple and practical guide for experiencing a meaningful time of prayer with God. The four letters stand for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So this is the pattern that we're using to build a prayer network over the staff and ministries of the United States. Bill Hybels is my pastor, and he wrote a book called Too Busy Not to Pray. And he says that it's the essential uh, element to begin times of prayer in a posture of adoration, and he gives four reasons for it. First, it sets the tone for the entire prayer. Secondly, it reminds us of God's identity and inclination, what his uh, character displays. Thirdly, it purifies the one who's praying because you get in the character of God and it begins to wash through your own soul. Fourthly, it's a worthwhile place to start because God is worthy of adoration. So in each of these, you see adoration reminds us that God is a person, not a commodity to be used. He is the sovereign ruler of the universe. God is to be worshiped and adored for his goodness, for his mercy, his kindness, his justice, his glory, wisdom, and love. David said in Psalm 63, 3 and 4, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. So in our prayer cord ministry, I'm trying to lift up the names of God because he's got 52 names uh, throughout the Bible, and those names tell us something about the God that we serve. The second is confession. And that is merely agreeing with God. It's the word hamalagao. It means to say the same thing that God says about our sin. And we invite him to reveal anything wrong that may be in our heart or our life, realizing that sin stands in the way of us experiencing God and confessing it opens the way for his full blessing. In Psalm 66, 18 and 19, 
The psalmist said, if I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord will not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. So as we root out sin, he's much more open uh, to answer and hear our requests. Thanksgiving recalibrates our heart and reminds us that God is our Father and that he loves to pour out blessings on his children. God is genuinely moved when he hears a child expressing his or her heartfelt gratitude. Like David said in Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. I'm a grandfather now. I have five grandchildren. Our youngest uh, are six and four. And I can just get so excited when my grandchildren crawl up on my lamp and they say, Grandpa, you know what? I love you. <laughs> uh, or they come and run and put their arms around me and say, thank you for whatever gift we bring them. They're so appreciative of uh, the small things. And yet, so many times, we forget to thank God for the good things. So I'm trying to teach our people that you always approach God's face before you approach his hand. And that preparation before supplication comes is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then supplication. Supplication is when we bring our requests to God. And, and, and nothing is too big for God for us to ask. And nothing is too small for him to be interested in. When we have attuned our heart in adoration, honestly confessed our sin, poured out our gratitude for answered prayer and his many blessings, we're now in a place to approach his hand. We should always approach his face before we approach his hand. God invites us to ask anything in his name and he'll grant it to us. In the context of evangelism, we need to pray like the Apostle Paul who said, pray also for me in this Ephesians 6 context of the spiritual warfare that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains and pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I had my trainers memorize that part of the scripture because I wanted them to understand that when we go out, we need to really express the gospel fearlessly, understanding that he's going to be going with us and he's going to be preparing the hearts. So the third thing I want to emphasize is the power of prayer. When, when you get your prayer partner team praying like this, you can walk forward with a holy boldness. It'll take your evangelism explosion ministry to a whole new level. And the writer of Hebrews chapter 4, 16 says, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The prophet Jeremiah ex exclaims in Jeremiah 32, 17, ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Our Heavenly Father actually gives us an open invitation in Jeremiah 32, 27, when he says, Behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So he's basically saying, bring it on. Whatever your request is, bring it on. I wonder if we really believe that God is waiting to hear and to grant our requests. Jesus throws out a similar invitation in John 14, 13, and 14 when he said, Whatever you ask in my name, that I'll do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. When are we going to see God as our loving Heavenly Father who longs to pour out blessing on, on us for, of every kind? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 11, if you, then be, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them who ask? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10.4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. When you get your prayer partners involved in warfare praying, you will see amazing things begin to happen. Encourage them to pray daily for you and your team members by name. Encourage them to pray for divine appointments. 
ask them to pray daily by first name only for the people whom you are planning to visit. Have them pray for the evangelism explosion leadership in your church. Keep a list of answers to prayer so that you can thank and praise God for his faithfulness, for the way he's worked. You see, nothing fuels prayer more than answered prayer. Now, as far as reading assignments for this session, for those of you taking this uh, course for credit, I would like you to get the E.M. Bounds in, uh, book entitled The Necessity of Prayer and read all 112 pages of it. Now, it's not easy reading, but that's okay. It'll force you to dig. And you can also get online versions of this. For those of you in the certificate program, Google The Necessity of Prayer book by E.M. Bounds and read whatever you can online. Reread the Partners in Praying booklet because it's got a wealth of information. For your writing assignment, I'd like you to interview two prayer partners other than your own and ask them to describe their most recent prayer partner experience and then write a one-page report. Ask them if they met with their EE team members on a regular basis. Ask them to describe one of the most exciting answers to prayer that they experienced in uh, their last session. Ask them if there was something more that would have made their prayer partner experience richer and more meaningful. Read the high priestly prayer of the Lord at least twice. Outline the various sections, pick out themes, subpoints in John 17, and I believe that you're going to be instructed in how to pray. So the two books I've referred to are The Necessity of Prayer by Ian e. Bounds and Too Busy Not to Pray by Bill Hybels. Until next time, God bless.